it's okay to have all kinds of, you know, all kinds of feelings about taking clients, not taking clients, when they leave, when they stay, you know, all that stuff. I think it's just really um, important to, to recognize and, and feel like, yeah, there can be room within, like within me for all of that. This is Therapist Clubhouse, a podcast for private practice entrepreneurs. I'm Annie Schusler. This week, I'm talking to Alexis Lezen, a private practice entrepreneur in the Bay Area in California. Listen as she gets deep about working through scarcity issues and raising her fees, and about talking about fees with clients. Hi, Alexis. Welcome to the clubhouse. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. It's good to be here. Yay. So I want to hear about your therapy practice, and I want to start with how long have you been in private practice? Um, okay, let's see. Well, I started seeing clients in private practice in a private practice internship in 2009. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and then was fully licensed in 2012. How do you think most people find you? How do most of your clients end up in your practice? I think most of them probably now come from client referrals. Uh, I would say that's the majority. And then they come through colleagues, through, um, you know, friends, sometimes friends of friends, people who are, or, or friends of friends of friends kind of thing. Uh, but I would say most of them come through clients. Okay. So it sounds like whether they're from clients or through other kinds of referrals, it's mostly through word of mouth. Like it's yeah. not as much people finding you through the internet. Right. Right. I, I'm listed on psychology today and I would say maybe I get, I don't know, so few, like maybe like a referral every two months from psychology today. And then of those, the ones that I end up seeing is probably half. You know, that's actually not a small amount compared to a lot of people. Really? Um, yeah. Um, just because, I mean, if you think about how we're in the Bay Area and it's such a right, so saturated, ample, or or you know, could we mm -hmm. could say saturated? Or we could say plentiful <laughs> <laughs> with therapists. <laughs> but yeah, there's so many of us that um, that's actually that's a pretty good return on investment. And do you? So you don't use the internet that much. Has that been because you were able to fill your practice just through referrals, or what ended up making you not? Like you don't have a website, is that right? I do. Oh, I do you do? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, right. But I have a website that I made maybe six years ago and haven't really looked at it. Yeah. I mean, I guess th those are tasks like um, internet marketing and website stuff that I find really daunting. Yeah. And I think, you know, if I if I had more of a push to do it because I needed to, I would do it. But I guess because I haven't, I haven't really, I haven't really done that very much. So how do you think things are going so well for you where, you know, some people are having a really hard time filling their practices? How do you think yours has stayed full? One of the things that feels, um, that I feel really, really lucky about was, was really the way that I started. And I think that's been a big piece of kind of getting more quickly to a point where I could have more client referrals or word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was that I had an amazing supervisor whose, um, whose practice was full. And when we started working together, I was her, her first, I think, I don't know if she's continued supervising, but, um, and we had a great fit and she was very supportive and she referred people to me a lot. It was also during the, it was, you know, during the economic downturn, a lot of people were looking for a therapist that was lower fee. Mm -hmm. So I, I was able to see a lot of clients early on. And then I also, um, I had been the camp therapist at Camp Tawanga as part of my internship when I was getting my hours. And I saw a number of, of people that I had seen there who wanted to continue with me during the off season. So I had those two right away that were, really huge for me in, in like being able to build my practice pretty, you know, relatively quickly in those first years. So I, I think. So you just got like these really important hubs going that right. brought people in and helped you get known and. Right. Yeah. And that were really good fits. I think that was mm -hmm. like, that was the piece that was so, um, 
that I feel really lucky about. And that I also think, you know, was a part of a, a process of kind of following, really following the next intuitive step, you know, which was like, okay, this is some, you know, with my supervisor, I re I felt, I, I understood that I was going to learn a lot from her and that I was also really comfortable to, to learn and grow and be myself and um, really come to her with, you know, challenging clinical issues. And um, so that was just, it was, she was really a mentor. Mm. Uh, so I think that was another piece was really following that, that sense. And I, the first, when I first started seeing clients, I was work, I was getting my hours and working at a school and starting to see clients. Um, so it wasn't like I started right away. Like I'm going to just see people in private practice. I couldn't, I couldn't afford to do it. And, and it just wasn't that, that wasn't how I started, but I started sort of fitting, fitting clients in like, it, you know, really like ungodly hours in the early morning. And then I would go work at a school. And Oh, so you started your private practice kind of like around the edges yeah. of that job? Oh. Yeah, exactly. And then kind of made the leap where I realized if I had like two more clients, it would basically financially be about the same as a week at the school. Isn't that crazy when you make that realization? Like, I think for me, it kind of happened like sitting in, um, when I was working in an agency, it kind of happened sitting in a staff meeting uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> where I was like, and then if I multiply, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and then was it scary when you made the leap? It was terrifying. Oh. It was terrifying. I mean, there was really, you know, the first, the first several years I was always like, okay, and when is this going to, when is this going to disappear? Or when is it going to just sort of fall away? You know, how it didn't, I didn't have a sense of stability for, for a long time. And it was really scary. How did you get through the scary time? Was it just time or were there things you would tell yourself? Both. And a lot of it, the thing I would tell myself was like, I would sort of do a review and I would look back and go, okay, like there's an ebb and flow, but overall there's a, there's an increase. And that was really helpful to kind of, to really, to see that and to kind of use that evidence as a way to kind of counteract those voices that were telling me like it, it maybe was really foolish or I shouldn't have let go of working at the school. Yeah. And yeah. were there any people who were kind of on one side or the other people in your life who were either saying, you know, yeah, this is really risky, Alexis, I don't know about this. Or we're saying, you know, no, this is great. You should do this. Um, yeah, well, my, my wife, and I think that was really important. She mm -hmm. was really helpful in kind of being like, I think when I was like, wait, is this just the adolescent part of me? Who's just like driving mm -hmm. off of a cliff, <laughs> you know? And she was like, no, it's not. Or when I was like, a really precious client is leaving and what am I going to do like yeah. about that spot, you know? And she was like, ebb and flow, ebb and flow. Like she was really kind of the voice of that for me ah. um, in those early years. And that was really helpful. And she was really supportive of me leaving the the job that I had, which was helpful because we both tend to have a scarcity mentality around, <laughs> around our financial situation. So that was really helpful. Oh, that's really, so that was really like her seeing what was going to make you happier. Right. And seeing that I was doing it, like yeah. she could see that it was happening and I couldn't always where I was <laughs> like, maybe I'm not, I'm not there yet. I think I'd had it in my mind too, that it was like, I have no idea where I got this, but I thought it took about 10 years to build a private practice. Ouch. And yeah. So I, I think it was like, everything was such a, <laughs> like, such a lengthy period. It was like, how long does it take to get through school? How long does it take to get your hours? And so there was a way that I had just prepared myself, I guess, for this super long period. Yes. I remember someone saying to me, like, you know, I've heard, and they were trying to say it in a way that was comforting to me, where they said something about 10 years, like, you know, in 10 years, you'll feel really secure <laughs> as a therapist in private practice. And I remember feeling like, ah, yeah, like yeah. I have a small child, like I'm planning on having a lot of things happen in the next 10 years. I don't want to be insecure for 10 years. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> right, exactly. What about the negative voices? Like were there were there actual people who were kind of being naysayers or or telling you to be cautious or were there more like the voices that we have in our heads? It was really the voice in my head. Um yeah. 
yeah, it was really, nobody was saying that um, overtly. There was no, nobody said to me, like, I don't think, I don't think this is a good idea. I remember going out to dinner or around that time or early on with, with some friends and their friends who I hadn't met before and their friends who I hadn't met before. One of them was telling me how she had an agency job. Um, she was a therapist and she had an agency job and she just said, you know, private practice was just, you know, and, and she was sort of commiserating with me. Like she said, you know, it's just, it's just way too tenuous and it just, you never know. And I, I couldn't do that anymore. And I, you know, I had been an actor before I was a therapist. So I understood that life. And that was actually the thing that I was wanting to get away from. Mm. So, um, I remember feeling at that time, like, okay, I have to, I know I, ha this is going to be something I need to just be really clear about with myself. Like it, I, I cannot be in a, I don't want to be 10 years down the road feeling like I'm not really sure what's, you know, how stable my practice is. Yeah. And do you think for you having been an actor or, well, I mean, I know you're still an actor, but you can't take that out of you. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back on the boards one day again. <laughs> but I wonder if that gave you kind of a career to compare this to that made it seem not quite so scary. It did. Mm. It totally did. Especially, you know, even though, like I said, I'm fairly lazy about um, marketing, but even like in making my website, it was like the feeling that I was not that I, I was definitely like coming from, you know, a personal place of this is who I am. And this is what, you know, it might be like to work with me. I was also really offering a service. And as an actor, when you market, you know, you market yourself, you market your mm. appearance. And there's so many parts of it that were unbearably painful for me. And that, um, that I hated. And so all of it, that, yeah, that made the, those parts of, of having a new career really, um, in comparison, much easier. Oh my God. I'm thinking like how, when I'm working with therapists who are building their practices, there's a lot of feelings about the photo, for right. example, like the idea of getting a headshot. And I mean, I know it's like 2017, people are pretty much over it, but still it's not fun to get a headshot and to have to put pictures of yourself on your website. And I'm right. thinking for an actor, you were like, yeah, get over it. Like you've, you've already been through that. I mean, it was, it was, it wasn't, yeah, get over it, but I was like, okay, this feels so much better yes, than so much less like, gross. Yeah. Yeah. So much less gross. It was really feeling like, you know, in, in, and it, actually one of the reasons I haven't changed my picture is because the experience of having them taken, I had a good friend who is uh, an actor in New York and he had come back and was to visit and was like taking headshots for people. Mm. Um, and the experience of having the pictures taken and kind of knowing him and the way I felt um, in it, but also like taking my pictures in this new way you know, in this way of being like, it's not really about, you know, somebody evaluating my picture based on like, is this exactly, you know, the person we want in this role, but more like, what is the presence? What is it like, can my presence come through in it was so, was so relieving. I mean, which is actually probably really useful and a great way for actors to approach their pictures getting taken. But um, it was so pleasurable, and like I was so happy with the pictures because I was like, "Oh, that's me. That looks like me." Oh, of course, <laughs> now yeah. it doesn't as much because they were taken a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your business model like? Meaning, how many clients do you see a week, and are you are you doing one on one and couples? Are those the services you offer, or do you offer mm -hmm. other stuff? Like this week. I'm, I have 25 client hours. That's, um, that's I a don't, lot, Alexis. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, it's a lot. And it's, that's like, that's the out, outermost edge for me of like where, what I can do before I feel like I'm not as present. I'm not as, you know, effective. I, you know, that's kind of, and that's my, my preferred number is 22. Mm -hmm. And what's your fee? Uh, my full fee is one fifty for individuals mm -hmm. and one sixty five for couples. 
How has it been getting to that number? Like, has that been a journey getting to that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And a, (laughs) and a painful one. Cause you were saying you started as having a reputation with, you know, being a low fee therapist in the very beginning and getting referrals from your supervisor. Yeah. What's that been like? To, to raise my fees? Yeah. To raise your fees from there to where you are now over those years. Um, it's really, really, um, been kind of a rich journey. It took me a long time to, to raise my fees. I mean, I don't, I can't remember now some of, I know there were some bigger jumps in the beginning. It's funny. I just like felt my heart rate increase. Mm, Um, in the beginning, let me think, I think I started seeing people um, at $75 an hour. Um, that was how I started. And some people were lower than that, depending on what they could afford. And then maybe within like the first e- two years, then my fee was a hundred. And I think I raised it. I think I raised it to 120. I think it went from 100 to 120. But as far as how I encountered raising my fees with current clients, it was the most difficult part. It was easier for me to kind of raise my full fee, but, um, but, but letting clients know and kind of, um, making space for, for all of the various feelings, clinical issues, things that come up around fees was, um, was, you know, the, the, part for me that was, that was the hardest, but also I have found like very, very rich and, um, and amazingly, you know, and this is something that like I've noticed and talk about with a lot of clients, it's like money, talking about money and then the relationship of money between therapist and client is, is incredibly taboo. Yes. And so it sometimes feels really striking to me that it's like, there's so many there's so many areas that are, you know, are generally kind of pushed into the shadows that, um, that I, that I get to open up and be part of with, with clients. And then money is, you know, so often a client will say like, Oh, I'm feeling really good. I got a raise, you know, or, um, you know, my rent is increasing or I was able to put some money away. You know, it's like putting, actually talking about how much and what that means and, you know, is like, is sort of considered, you know, um, really inappropriate. And I think that's really interesting. Isn't that interesting? Like how it is a a place where talking about money, I guess, feels like it's not as taboo, but talking Mm -hmm. numbers can feel really taboo and can be really, I mean, I know as a therapy client can be really useful. Right. Very useful. And those numbers, they, yeah, like they mean so much to us. Like if we think about fee and like what 150 means now is probably something so different than what it meant six months ago, right. even. There's so much to talk about and feel through. Totally. Absolutely. There is so much. There is so much. And there's so much around, you know, the way that each of us, you know, f- views and feels about our how much we have or how little we have that is so, I think, you know, incredibly textured around how we feel about, um, how much or how little we are. Hmm. Yeah. And it seems like whether, you know, for the therapist and for the client, whether it's about feeling like guilt mm-hmm. or scarcity mm-hmm. or whatever it is that there's always like some shame on both sides. Right. And so then it's like, yeah, we just, we have to deal with our stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. It's not just like in another business where you just kind of suck it up and raise your fees. Like you really have to go deep. You really have to go deep. You really have to go deep. And with, with each, with each client when that arises. So, I mean, now I would say I raise my fees. I have been raising them the last few years about not quite once a year, but I would say, maybe every 14 to 16 months. I think that's such a good idea because um, I think when we don't, and I've definitely not Mm -hmm. before, um, like, you know, just let it go too long. Then we find ourselves in a position where we kind of have to make a big jump. And then that just makes it harder. 
right. for everybody. Right. I try with my clients. I with with current clients. I don't raise them more than generally than ten dollars a session when I raise them because mm-hmm. the the um I'm aware of the the you know the the increase for them. But I'll usually let them know, like, you know, since we've been seeing each other, I've raised my fees now twice. My full fee is 150 but um, I wanted to check in with you about, you know, the possibility of raising us to 140 and to kind of, and then see, you know, what that, what is that brings up for them and how that is and kind of welcome all the various issues, including what they can afford. And then also the, the clinical issues that arise. So interesting, Alexis, when you just said, um, raise us to 140. I thought that was so kind of cool. Uh-huh. Instead of saying, raise your fee to 140. Right. Um, raise us to 140. Uh-huh. I, I wasn't. Yeah. It really makes it feel collaborative. Like we can talk about right. this. <laughs> we can talk about this <laughs> decision that I've you know, made, but, um, but yeah, it it is. And it is collaborative. And I've had clients say, I can't do that. And then we go from there. And I also make it clear to them, like, this is not, and it, it, I have, I have not approached raising my fees with any client that that's a deal breaker that if we, if, if they can't afford it, that I can't see them any longer. Um, and that's just important. That's not something that is, that would work for every therapist for sure. But for me, that feels better. It feels better to me as a client, um, is that feeling of kind of like, you know, here's, here's where we're going or we'd like, I'd like to take us, you know, but, um, Mm -hmm. but if you can't, (laughs) that is, then we will continue. So Alexis, if you could time travel back to the start of your private practice, what would you tell the Alexis of that time? I think I would tell myself like, that I could really trust that, um, that, that it was, that it was, I was going to build a practice and that, um, that I could support myself and my family that way, you know, which was, that was sort of my big fear really was like, what if this basically, what if this doesn't work? So I think it would be a lot of it would just be to sort of trust it and to trust that, that, um, I didn't know exactly how long it was going to take, but that it was, it was going to happen. Mm. Yeah. Great. How do you tend to balance the rest of your life with your therapy business? Um, well, some of it's through the way that I, through my schedule. So, um, Mm -hmm. I, so I work four days a week, Mondays I'm in San Francisco and then Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays I'm in my Oakland office. And, um, so for me having Wednesdays is in the middle of the week is really important. Um, and I've, there've been times I thought maybe it would be nice to have Mondays. There's so many Monday holidays, but I really like having it so that no matter how many clients I see or how intense a work day might be, I don't have, I never have three days in a row. So I know that I always have that it, I might have two in a row and then I have a day to myself, a day where I can exercise and take care of things and um, have time to myself. For me, it's really a lot through this schedule and, and then also scheduling, you know, so that I can pick my son up from school uh, at least two days a week or, and also like I schedule so that I have a block of time in the middle of the day um, so that I can walk and, um, have some time to myself and eat a nice lunch. And like, so that I can do, I schedule my days in a way where I'm also protective over my kind of restorative time. And do you tend to stick to that pretty hardcore to like not schedule people during that lunch break? Yeah. I mean, I don't, not hardcore. I would say like, if there's, if there's like no other time to see somebody in their you know, really in a crisis if they are really, if I know that, you know, that it's really important to see them on the urgent side, then I would schedule them, but only as like a one-off kind of thing, not, not as a regular, like if somebody calls me, if I'm full and somebody called and said, you know, well, I could see you at noon. Uh, I would not take them if it meant I regularly missed that time. Okay. I think that's so important. Like, I think that's where you're able to hold on to your self care. I think that's one of those pivotal little decisions that you just described that sometimes get people 
not taking care of themselves. Like, well, but I needed that mm-hmm. client and then, you know, and it becomes this slippery slope. So um, I think that's so great that you've got it clear. I need Wednesdays. I need these blocks in the middle of my day. Yeah. It took me a long time to do that. And it took mm-hmm. kind of some really, some really hard experiences for me to actually understand. I mean, some of it is just, you know, just aging. Like, I think, mm-hmm. you know, um, I can totally imagine, you know, had I started, had I become a therapist earlier in my life, um, like if I was started seeing people in my early thirties, I, there's no doubt in my mind, I would have overscheduled myself and I would have been, and I would have prided myself on being able to do that. And I think it just, mm. you know, that it got that I, that I had some times of one day I rem- and, and Oh, the other thing I should mention is the other scheduling piece that, you know, I didn't have a lot of control over was for so long having subletted spaces. So I was in offices. Sometimes, um, I subletted an office that I still sublet in San Francisco and then in, uh, Oakland. And like in Oakland, I would be, I would have a half day on Thursdays in that space. So everybody I scheduled, I had to end at one o'clock. Um, so that at that time kind of dictated my schedule. So I would kind of fill like when I was full, I would just fill whatever space I had available. And I also had a half day too on Tuesdays. I'm remembering. So now, um, I have my own office in Oakland. And so that gives me more flexibility to, to kind of carve that middle of the day period for myself and to protect Mm -hmm. it. So that, and that like, there were times that I would, you know, try to squeeze 10 or 11 clients in on a day and end up feeling like, okay, I was not, you know, that was not, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel fair to my clients and it doesn't feel good for me. So I think, but I had to learn that and then be like, oh yeah, you know, I think it's sort of like people who are, you know, in their twenties and they're like, I had four beers last night, but I actually felt fine, you know? And then (laughs) later they're like, no, that's, actually not anything I can do anymore. Yeah. It's truly true. And like we have this, if we listen, we really know what our optimal schedule is and how many people Mm -hmm. we can see. Right. And then depending on, you know, your other, whatever other voices there are around scarcity or potential, you know, for making money, there can be that kind of tension. And I've definitely had that where it's like, oh, but you know, it'd be really great. Or and just having to really listen, you know, or make room for myself to be like, is, how is that really for me? You know, how will it feel the morning that I wake up and know, like, I have, you know, nine clients and, and a one hour break in the middle? Yeah. Yeah. How will that really mm-hmm. be? Not like, I'm adding things up. That looks good. Right. And I think of like, like, not just to think, um, wealth is having the right mm-hmm. amount of money, but really wealth is, I mean, for me, is so much about right. time. It's so much about like freedom and time and being able to do the things that I want to do when I'm not working. So those are at least, I mean, once I'm hitting my needs, like those are at least as important as making more money. Totally. Absolutely. Uh, d- really, really clearly. That is so true for me. I like looking at that in terms of wealth and time. Will you join me for a listener question? Of course. I didn't even know there were, I had no idea that there were currently listeners. There are currently listeners. Oh my god! Yeah, it's so much fun. That is so much fun. (laughs) So, okay, this is a tough one that, you know, I know we've, we've both, I'm sure, dealt with. Listener question. How do you tell a client they are not a good fit for you after the initial phone call? That is so tricky <laughs> and something that I still am working at. So um, I, I'm totally approaching this with a learner's mind. But, mm-hmm. um, but you know, sometimes I might say something like, I want to check in with you about, <laughs> I mean, maybe this is you know, putting too much on them, but, you know, how, how our phone call felt. I, I had some, you know, I had some concern about, you know, how it might be to work together. And I'm wondering what you felt, you know, I might just sort of open that back up. I will say, you know, and I, I mean, I had supervisors say this of sort of like, you know, tell them that you're full. 
I, I really have a hard time doing that. Um, I don't feel like I can do it successfully and I've definitely done it. And I think the client gets the message that you don't want to work with them, but I don't know. But, you know, not too long ago I had, um, I had a phone call with someone, um, and I was getting, uh, I was just having a really sinking feeling about what it might be like to work together. And, Mm. and I sort of, and, and, and she was, I mean, throughout the phone call, it was clear that, you know, she was feeling that, but I think she felt that with a lot of people on the phone. And so that was sort of part of her difficulty was really wanting to come in and see me, but also not feeling comfortable. And I basically said, I said to her, how are you feeling right now? You know, what is, you you know, this is sort of some sense of what it might be like to work with me. How are you feeling? And she was saying, I don't know. I liked when you said this, but I didn't like when you said that, you know, and there was kind of this push pull. And I said, you know, it's just super important. You know, you're making this huge step for yourself and it's really important, you know, that you feel, um, that you feel that it's a good fit. And it's really important that I feel it's a good fit, you know? And so, and I think maybe we're both expressing some question about that. And that was really in that instance, that was enough. You know, Mm. I think she was like, okay, well, I'm going to look around and I'm going to tell you, you know, if I'll call you back if, if I want to see you. And, um, it was very clear to me that she wouldn't and that, um, but I, I I actually, I, I can't think of a time I've ever said, you know, I don't feel good about this or I don't, but I don't feel like I've had to. I mean, mm-hmm. I think. But I like that, the way that you just laid out that conversation. Yeah. I mean, I think again, it's kind, and that is like how, how I, how I do approach my work, which is collaborative, you know, which is kind of like, let's, let's mm-hmm. be kind of, let's open up what's happening now. But I will say, you know, I had a feeling when I hung up, like, okay, that really wouldn't, that was not right. And it did feel a little bit scary. Like, well, what if, you know, what if she didn't, think so. But, um, but it's really unusual. (laughs) I think, I think people can feel it. And I think sometimes they don't feel empowered. You know, they think like, well, therapy is just going to be really uncomfortable. So I guess that's what made that phone call feel kind of off. And, and every once in a while, I will say somebody I've said to someone, like I've kind of raised that idea, but I want to see them in person and they want to see me in person. And I say, Mm -hmm. you know, because I don't know, I, I can't always tell on the phone. And so I'll say, you know, do you want to make an appointment to see, to kind of carry on this conversation, but in person so we get a better felt sense of what it might be like to work together? That's so great too, because it's not like, um, when people really need clients, sometimes they can forget those skills of like, let's continue this conversation. Let's see if this is the best fit for you. I want you to get the very best therapy. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, totally. I mean, that is the biggest challenge I think of starting a practice and it um, was for me for sure, which was like, how do I, you know, keep, how do, what do I do with like the flood of feeling that I have around whether or not a client comes to see me wh- when they leave, you know, that like, mm-hmm. you know, pretty much in the beginning, every client who left for all kinds of different reasons felt to me like, um, on, there was a part of me that felt like scared and abandoned and how is my practice ever going to work? Mm-hmm. And then I was like, okay, well, this is not <laughs> like, this is not what I want to be bringing in here. And certainly not something yeah. that I processed overtly with clients, but it was something that was helpful for me to be really aware of that was like, okay. And then, and still, what do they, you know, what do they need? But, you know, even to this day, there have been times like I've, I had a client who wrote, wrote an email to me and said, you know, I think I want to stop for a while. And it's actually somebody that I I still see, um, from time to time, but said, I want to stop for a while. And I couldn't think of how to respond. It was like, Mm -hmm. I didn't, there were too many parts to it. And I, I didn't want to call them. I didn't want to email them, but I didn't want to call them. I don't know. And I got sort of stymied and then it took me forever Mm -hmm. to write back. And I thought, oh, because this is plugging into something else for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just think being aware of that and and also being like, it's okay to have all kinds of, you know, all kinds of feelings about taking clients, not taking clients, when they leave, when they stay, you know, all that stuff. I think it's just really um, important to to recognize and, and feel like, yeah, there can be room within, like within me for all of that. So important. I think for me, um, 
if I know when I'm talking to someone, like my spidey sense is just like, "Eh -eh, Mm -hmm. this isn't going to be good. Mm -hmm. Then I'll usually say, um, usually I can think of someone who I think like, yep, this is the kind of person so-and-so does really well with. Oh, that's so so good. Yeah. So then I'll be like, even if I don't have their information right there, I'm like, I'm just, I'm thinking of someone who I think would be such a good therapist for you. Um, I'm going to give you their name, maybe a couple other names. I'll email you with that. Um, I just, I just don't think I'll be able to be for what you want to work on and, you know, remembering about this other therapist. I want to do that for you. And then that's pretty easy. I think if it's um, something that I realize either right after the conversation or once we've started, then that's where it feels trickier. And then that's where I would want to, I would want to listen to this recording of what you just said and, and have those kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. But I really like, I mean, it's, it's a, I mean, I think that's, that's a really, um, that's a wonderful way to do it. And I think, um, I'm not, that's not something that I'm very good at accessing in a moment. Mm. Like it would take me Mm. a while to think about kind of who might be a good fit. Um, especially if I'm part of me is sort of, um, like I'm thinking about that recent phone call and I, that part of me felt sort of some of the client's panic. Oh yeah. And was yeah. kind of like, uh, and my own feeling in fight or flight was, you know, total flight. Mm-hmm. So it was like hard. It's, but I think that's a brilliant to kind of have that ready you know, to have like, I mean, it's just a good reminder. Like I could be much more organized this way to have, you know, lists and sort of, and, and thinking about kind of like where, you know, in this particular instance, I felt like somebody with a really strong DBT background would have been fantastic, Yeah, you know, and not yeah, yeah. having that kind of, um, not having that top of mind was, you know, I mean, it would have been great to be able to say that, like, you know, I don't know from, you know, some of the stuff that's happening, how it might be for us to work together, but here's somebody I'm thinking of who I think would be great for you. You know, please give them a call. It would be really, really good. So I really like that. Thank you for that. Oh, yeah. So Alexis, what's the best place for people to contact you, find you, throw compliments at you? Can they reach you through your website? They can. Um, my website and they can see the picture of me taken sometime <laughs> around 2011 or 12, as we've discussed, um, which is <laughs> just my name, Alexis Lezen with a Z, L-E-Z-I-N.com. Thank you so much, Alexis. Thanks for being open and, and being in the clubhouse. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been really, really fun. I was kind of, I was joking with a friend this morning that you know, I was like, I, if Annie asked me all about like running a business, what if I don't even think about my business like I run a business? You know, I was like, I don't have any answers. I don't know. I'm just a therapist. I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> Look how much you know. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. This is such a cool thing. And it's such a cool thing that you're doing for therapists. It's so huge. And like this, it just seems super important. I think like, you know, I think in graduate school, like there was so little about how to actually build a practice. And then somehow everybody was sort of scattered to the winds and just, you have to figure it out on your own as opposed to, but it's like, why, you know, you don't actually have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of people have done it. Yes. And they all did it like so differently. And all did it so differently. Well, so thank you so much. This has been really fun. Thanks, Alexis. My pleasure. Today's snark moment. Snark moment is about the word authentic. Now, I'm guilty of this. I'm sure that you could find the word authentic on my website. But somehow, therapists have all decided that we're going to use the word authentic. And we're going to use it on our About Me page. And we're going to describe the way that we work with clients as authentic. Unfortunately, it feels like the word authentic has started to lose its meaning. And so we're going to have to get more creative and talk about what it actually means to be authentic. We're going to have to describe what we're talking about as if the word authentic didn't exist and we had to find other ways to describe what we're trying to say. So what does authentic mean to you? Does it mean that you have a sense of humor and that you end up laughing with your clients in your therapy sessions? Does it mean that you sometimes say things that are difficult to hear? 
Um, maybe it means that your personality is really right up front. Um, maybe it means that, you know, I don't know what it means for you. Think about that. Think about what authentic means and then try and say that instead of using the word. I just think we have to let go of it. Thank you for listening to Therapist Clubhouse. If you'd like my help building your unique and profitable therapy practice, head over to coachingwithannie.com. I've got a ton of free training and resources for you no matter what stage of your entrepreneurial journey you're in right now.